Raise in the Roof, presented by the Central Indiana Realtist Association, a local chapter of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Our mission is to build wealth through home ownership by enhancing economic development. We accomplish this goal by informing, advocating, and educating in the communities we serve. And now, Raisin the Roof. Central Indiana Realtors Association, we invite real estate professionals to join us at our monthly meeting first Wednesday of each month at MCL Castleton, 1130 a.m., where our mission is advocating, informing, and educating. Our vision is building wealth through home ownership. See you there. Father of four children, my proudest accomplishment. I always like to say that because if, if, I, if I don't do anything else well, I do my best to do that well. I do my best. It's hard. I got grown children. I have, my youngest is 21 now. For those of you who are fathering or mothering grown children, that transition from doing what I tell you to do to just work it out, or them telling me what to do, man, it's tough. So, I, um, I got to say a couple of things. Uh, you guys are a beautiful room, a beautiful room, a beautiful group of people, and I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I think you should give yourselves a hand for just how good you look today. <laughs> now, I'm not really diverse. I didn't come to talk about diversity in real estate. I didn't come to talk about white housing stuff or Asian housing stuff or Hispanic housing stuff. I came to talk about black housing. I came to talk, it's okay if I just be black today. Is that okay? You're laughing, I want somebody to say yes. I'm gonna be black. I brought my own car. And I got my return ticket. <laughs> so, and, and mind you, mind you, mind you, if somebody don't speak for us, who is? Somebody got to speak up. And, and so and so, we got to pick up the mantle and, and speak up. It's not against anybody else. But when you're at the bottom of every good statistic and the top of every bad statistic, it's time for somebody to speak up. I've been cut, I'm bleeding, I'm tired of bleeding, I don't want a band-aid, I want a cure. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so, so, so I am with NARAP, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. We were founded out of a need. There was a time after World War II in 1947 when blacks were having a housing crisis. Here in Indiana, they had a housing crisis. They came back from World War II. There was no place to live. It was crowded housing in, in, the, black, in the black areas and no housing available. And, and there were riots nationwide and unrest behind housing opportunity. And, and blacks were not allowed to join the National Association of Realtors. So they formed 12 
people, 11 men and one woman, met on July, I think, 29, 1947, and formed the National Association of Real Estate Brokers with the motto of democracy in housing. That's how we got to be here. It's an organization that is, encompasses all diversity, all ethnicities, but our focus is what it was, and, and that is black housing. So I, I looked at the Central Indiana Realtors Association motto to serve the unserved and the underserved, okay? And, and I think that's important because I find in rooms like this, this is the top of the echelon. This is, this is the top 20%, but there's 80% out there that has no idea what's going on. All they know is it's bad and they're just trying to get through the day. Ain't nobody speaking for them. They don't have the facility, the ability, or the capacity to speak for themselves. So somebody has to speak for all of us. Both the top 20%, the bottom 20%, and that middle 60%. And, and so that's what we do. We speak for the unserved and the underserved. Now, Shelly Specchio, CEO of MyBor Realtor Association. We support the mission of the Central Indiana Realtist Association to improve the quality of life for the underserved and enhance the economic development for the community. At MyBor, our leadership in economic and community development efforts directly impact the strength of our communities and promote the importance of homeownership for all. Learn more about how realtors strengthen our communities at MyBor.com. The gap represents wealth. And, and what I want to say to you today is the gap that we see, the low black home ownership rate and the higher white home ownership rate, the gap is intentional. It's intentional. How is it intentional? Through public policy. Public policy is the laws, priorities, and governmental actions that reflect the attitudes and rules selected for the people. Let's discuss today how public policy affects and impacts black home ownership. You know, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. I see it's too late for that. Trust me, um, I know what I got to say and I know that it's an uncomfortable subject. I know that, and, and, and again, I, I, I just, just let me just give you some information. Started out, we all know that that uh, 
there was slavery in America. And, and then in 1865, Major Granger rode in on his ship in Galveston Harbor and announced that the slaves were now workers, free laborers, and that the owners were now, were now, were now uh, bosses, and the relationship had changed, and they weren't slaves anymore. And, and so the slaves were free, let go. And, and, and they did okay for a while. We had a good period for a while until it, it got to be too free. And then they started with re, uh, 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 laws that, that, that impacted and, and put people back in the situation that they thought that they should be. So with regard to housing in cities, we had racially exclusive zoning laws. Okay, in, in other words, and, and what, what they would do is they'd say, like in St. Louis, they had the civil court case of Buchanan versus Warden. It was illegal for a black person to buy a property that was in a majority white neighborhood, and it was also illegal for a white person to buy a property and live in it that was in a majority black neighborhood. They said that was the same, so it should not be discriminatory because it worked both ways. The problem is the black neighborhoods were not up to par with the other neighborhoods, so this 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 lawyer, Wardley, he bought a property from Mr. Buchanan and made it known in his contract that he intended to live it, it was on 37th and Valance in Louisville, Kentucky, made it known that he intended to live in it, and when he made it known that he intended to live in it, they would not allow that, so Buchanan sued him to make him finish the contract, make him perform, and since he could not perform, it was upheld by the Louisville City uh, Courts, and it was upheld by the Kentucky Courts, and it was overturned in in, uh, in Supreme Court, and it made illegal zoning based on purchase contracts, notice to perform, illegal in this country. And several cities, including Indianapolis, had racially exclusive, exclusive zoning. In Indianapolis in 1926, what they did, there was a case in New Orleans, I think it was Tyler versus Harmon, where, where instead of making it buy, it was just tenancy. They said that because you could buy wherever you wanted, you just couldn't live there if it was black in a white neighborhood or white in a black neighborhood without written documentation from all of the citizens of the neighborhood. So in Indianapolis, they passed that same ordinance based on that law being upheld so far. Um, the Indianapolis 20, uh, 1926, the Indianapolis City Council drafted and passed a residential zoning ordinance prohibiting blacks from moving into predominantly white neighborhoods without the consent of white residents and vice versa. The thing that, that, that happened after that was this guy, uh, no pun intended, Dr. Guy L. Grant, a black physician, bought a house and, and with the intent of living in it, it was stated in the contract and, 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 and in, in Indianapolis without the permission of the rest of the tenants and of the rest of the occupants and they sued him. So, so Gilliard sued him, the guy he was buying it from, sued him and said, you have to move in. He won this case, he lost the case here, won the case in the Supreme Court. So, so Hi, I'm Priscilla Russell, your team with Hustle with United Real Estate. We've been serving Indianapolis area for over 37 years. We help our clients build generational wealth through home ownership. When you need a home, or you need to sell a home, please call us at 317-872-SELL. Hello, my name is Sherry Goodwin. I'm a home lending officer with First Merchants Bank. I'm so excited to be partnering with Central Indiana Realtors Association in regards to increasing home ownership in the Indianapolis and surrounding areas. First Merchants Bank has an awesome no money down program and no private mortgage insurance. Essentially, it can be a 100% financing program. Give me a call. My name is Sherry Boutwin. I'd love to be able to help you. 317-566-6123. After they got rid of exclusionary zoning, that, that became illegal throughout the country based on Supreme Court law, private covenants came into a place, came into place. Anybody familiar with private covenants? When, when the developer, when the landowner would sell the land to the developer, they would put in the deed that, that you couldn't sell it or, or, or have it occupied by anybody other than Caucasians, okay? So, and, and, and the thing that was important about this is that it ran with the land. 
Okay, as a matter of fact, in Los Angeles, 80% of our deeds are that way. They're still there. It's just the Supreme Court overturned it in 1947 with Shelley v. Crane. They overturned it and made it not enforceable. Okay, it, and, and what they said was, privately, you can do it, but you can't use state police power to enforce it. So those restrictions still exist on the deeds. They just usually don't show up anymore. They don't show them anymore, but they're still there. They're just not legally enforceable. When I first started doing real estate in Los Angeles, we get a title report, and the first time I saw one, I was shocked. You know, I was shocked. So the only way a black person could be in the neighborhood that I live in now was if he was a, a handyman or a maid. After six o'clock. And, and you know, what I'm talking about is how we got to where we are today. Government sanction of how we got to where we are today, it was intentional, not an accident. Maintenance of status quo is the overwhelming social construct. How it's been is how it's going to be. Government redlining, how many of you guys are familiar with redlining? The federal government, starting in 1932, what was happening in 1932? We were in the, trying to come out of a depression, right? The federal government institutionalized racism in housing opportunity. How did it do that? It passed the Federal Home Loan Bank Act, 1932. It established 11 districts around the country, the federal home loan bank system, to try to get liquidity back into the mortgage market. And then in 1933, uh, passed the Home Owners Loan Act. The federal, the federal Home Loan Bank was chartered to supervise the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was created out of that act. And what did they do? They went around and mapped every city. They mapped every city, and I'm gonna show you a map in a moment. And then the 1934, the National Housing Act, which created FHA. FHA came before her, okay? It, it created FHA. And, and this is the Indianapolis redlining map, okay? Red meant it was an undesirable area, which generally meant it had black people or other people who weren't white in it, or factories, or undesirable conditions. Yellow, the same thing, more factories and undesirable conditions. Green, blue was established old white neighborhoods without blacks or other people in them, but, but established. And then greens were generally the new subdivisions of the up and coming house. This was what FHA used. I know y'all think FHA is the primary loan program for black folks. With its low down payment, easier credit qualifying, but it was created not for black folks at all. I actually have, I didn't bring it up here, I have this 1935 FHA underwriting manual, and it says so in it. That's Indianapolis. So then we get to 1968 and the Fair Housing Act. A lot of stuff. Last year we celebrated what? 50 years of the Fair Housing Act? A lot of stuff happened in 1968. What's some of the stuff that happened in 1968? We went to the moon. Remember that? Uh, I think it was North Korea took the U.S. Cudlow in 1968. John Carlos and them stood in, in, the, in the Olympics in Mexico City and, and ruined their lives in 1968. Um, Martin Luther King was shot and assassinated in 1968 on April 4th. There were riots throughout the city. And because this, this bill had been in, in play for a year and a half or so, couldn't get passed, couldn't get out of committee. But because of the, the riots and the civil unrest behind uh, the Martin Luther King being assassinated on April the 4th, 1968, on, by April the 11th, this bill made it not just out of committee, but through the House of Senate and was signed into law. But the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Now, here's what most of us don't know. The, the, the Fair Housing Act it's actually the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968. Okay, Fair Housing is Title Eight, but there's ten titles to the Act. Ti ti title One prohibits interference with federal troops. 
In other words, when there's a riot and we roll into your city, don't do anything to keep us from, from, from keep, you know, you can't keep us from stopping and quelling the violence. They put prison terms on it. Title II through Title VII deal with Indian civil rights. Title VIII is the Fair Housing Act, what we're familiar with. Title IX was the prevention of imitate, uh, uh, intimidation. I spelled that wrong. In fair housing cases. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> the older I get, the worse I spell, too. <laughs> In other words, I can't do things, you know, you had a high incidence of the Ku Klux Klan and so on. I can't do things to stop you from trying to break into areas that you weren't normally in. And then Title X uh, made it a felony punishable by up to 15 years in prison to obstruct, impede, delay, or affect the movement of police or commerce. So in other words, they were dealing with the insurrections that were going on. They also passed a rider. They put a rider on the bill that made it a felony to go from one state or city, one state to the next, and participate in any sort of uh, riot or insurrection. And, and, and you know, the only difference between a riot and a protest is what? The police showing up, right? So, so they were having protests, you know, and riots, People were upset around the country, and, and they, had to, they had to compromise in order to get this bill passed. This was part of the compromise, along with the omnibus crime bill, which $50 million were earmarked to local law enforcement. You know, the tanks and other military-type weapons you see going down your streets when there's a problem? That's where this started. It started with the 1968 Fair Housing Act, or really the Indian Civil Rights Bill. Okay, so there's more to this history than we get taught a lot of times. Hi, I'm Cheryl Taylor, Home Lending Officer with First Merchants Bank, and we are thrilled to partner with the Central Indiana Realtors Association to help increase home ownership in the Indianapolis and surrounding areas. First Merchants Bank has a fantastic program that requires no down payment, includes a $7,500 grant depending on where you're purchasing, and has a minimum credit score requirement of 600. If you're ready to begin your home ownership journey, please contact me at 317-566-7611. Hello, I'm Dolores Kennedy, broker owner of B&K Real Estate Services, where helping you buy or sell your home is what I do. Call me, you see the number, call me. Fair, fair housing, without cheating or trying to achieve an unjust advantage. Here, here, here's, here's the truth, this is, for two, this is nationwide across all ethnicities say black or white, Hispanic or Asian, this is period. It, in, in 2016, if you own a property, your net worth is generally average, aggregated across the country, 225,000. If you don't, it's 5,000. For black folks, that number, and, and if you notice, it's the rent side, if you're a tenant, your, your net worth is going down. Why? Because rent's going up. As we gain more people in the country, there, there's a higher demand for housing, and rent goes up across the board. In LA, I can't tell you, it's crazy in Los Angeles. For black folks, it's 90,000 and 2,000. In the United States today, July 1st, 2018, about a year ago, we have 327,167, 327 million, 167,434 in terms of total population. I want to give you some statistics. I don't just want to talk. I want to give you some statistics as to what that policy, these government policies have done. So I need to give you some numbers. Um, we're about 61% white. Hispanic is growing. It's about 18%. Black, 13.4%. Asian, 5.8%. That's, that's about our, that's our numbers in terms of major uh, ethnicity uh, breakup. Now, in terms of total mortgages done, total mortgages done, there were 7,339,097 mortgages. This is Honda data, most recent. This, this is uh, in, of, of all types of loans, purchase, refinance, uh, uh, repair, construction, all types of loans, as reported. 
uh, white, 4,846,000, Hispanic, 701,000, black, 436,000, and Asian, 386,000. Last year, black was 430-something, and Asian was 441. We, we, we're, not, we're not on the bottom of this particular number, but we are if you look at it as percentage of population. Black approval rate is only 47.13%. The black denial rate is 28.13% as compared to the white denial rate of 15%. Our denial rate is almost twice that of, of, of Caucasian, of our white uh, brothers. Our approval rate is less than 50%. Our approval rate, what happens when your approval rate is less than 50% to the conscious to your consciousness in your community, to your community consciousness. You quit trying to buy. Anybody ever get a, a, a credit card and you're approved in the, on, on the email or in the mail and, and, and you fill it out and, and it don't go through? It happened to me recently, it's been a year now or so. <laughs> I don't want to pre-approve your approval, low interest transfer. I, you know, the pre <laughs> Call us. <laughs> right? I got one the next week, I just looked at it. I wasn't doing that. I didn't want to feel that way again. That's what happens in a community when there's a, a mass of denials in that community. People stop trying because they don't want to feel that way, so they go buy a Lexus or a Cadillac or something to make them feel like they're successful since they don't have access to what it is they really want. Trust me, we really want to be homeowners. We really would rather have a house than a car. But I really want to show, based on my hard work, that I've had some sort of success.